Sit back, take some deep breaths, center your hearts and minds as we prepare our hearts for worship as Marion shares this morning's prayer. Stand as you are able in body, heart, and spirit for our call to worship. We are pulled in many directions. Many duties and tasks seek to lay claim on our lives. This day in this place, let service to God be our choice. This day in this place, we open our hearts and spirits to God. Blessed be the God of creation who has called us here. Praise be to God, who sustains and nourishes our lives. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as you're able in body and our spirit for our gathering hymn, God is Here, verses 1, 2, and 4.
our service where we give of our tithes and offerings. I will remind you if you have a joy or a concern that you would like shared, please drop that in the offering plate when it is passed by you this morning. When I think about all of the blessings that we have been given, I'm amazed. The very breath that we breathe is a gift from God. And there's no way that we would ever be able to give back in the same proportion what has been given to us. But I do invite you to take some time of discernment this morning and prepare your hearts and minds and give back this morning with grateful and cheerful hearts. Bridesmaids. 
And it's one of those stories that has been explained to me in a lot of different ways. But it's one of those stories that in my faith tradition previous to the one that I'm in now, we were told to always be ready. You didn't know when Christ was coming again, so always be ready. <clears throat> and I have to tell you, that, that I'm, and I'm not ashamed to tell you, that much of the things that I did growing up were because I was afraid I would be caught unready. And I remember one of those days living in fear that I could make a mistake and Christ could come again and that would be it for me. This is the life that I grew up with. And I remember very vividly in ninth grade chemistry class when Mr. Rickard was our teacher and Mr. Rickard attended the same church that me and my parents did. And I hated chemistry. Probably worse than algebra. <laughs> didn't make any sense to me and I didn't think I would ever use it. And I have to say that I very rarely have used any of the things that I learned in chemistry. But Mr. Rickard was a very, very good teacher, but he was very, very tough. And we had a test on this particular day and I was as prepared as I thought I could be. Mr. Rickard passes out the test and he leaves the room. He says, I have to go to the office. Well, you know what that caused in the class. As you can imagine, whispers were going around. People were sharing their answers. People were looking in their textbooks and somebody even went to Mr. Rickard's desk to find his answer key. I didn't do any of that. And I would like to tell you that it was for altruistic reasons, but it wasn't. It was for two reasons. Number one, Mr. Rickard would tell my parents. And number two, literally, I thought to myself, Christ could come again. And I have been caught cheating on the test. So I sat at my desk with my head down, trying my best. And Mr. Richard, Mr. Rickard comes in the class right before the end of class, goes over to the filing cabinet, picks up a box, and there is a video recorder. <laughs> and he says, I'm gonna teach you all a lesson about integrity that means more than chemistry. And he played the video. And all I could think was, thank God I didn't do anything. But again, it wasn't for altruistic reasons that I didn't do that. I lived in fear because of the way this particular passage had been explained to me. That if I didn't have enough oil in my lamps, if I hadn't done the good things that I was supposed to do and Christ came again, and I would be damned. And that is not a happy life to live, living in that constant fear. And I'm so thankful that over time and after unlearning a lot of the things that I was taught growing up, there's a certain sense of freedom in knowing that there's a different way to look at this particular passage. So I invite you into our reading this morning of Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. Jesus says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. 
Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. Clear as mud, right? <laughs> Clears it up so well. So what is this parable about? Because it seems so contradictory to other things that Jesus has said. Just in Matthew's gospel alone, I found three. Matthew chapter five, verse 42. Jesus says, give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. Well, the bridesmaids that didn't have enough oil asked and begged for oil for their lamps and they were told, no, go get your own, and they were locked out. Matthew chapter 19, verse 21, Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor. Again, the bridesmaids that had plenty of oil didn't share with those who didn't have as much. Matthew 23, verse 13, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. And in this parable that we read and that we just read, the door was shut and they were shut out because they didn't have enough oil in their lamps. So all of this leaves me wondering, what is it about this parable? What is it we're supposed to learn from this parable? What is the good news in this parable? Because it can be so hard to find. Well, there are a few things that I want to bring up. Number one, I don't think Jesus wants us to get out of this parable that the foolish bridesmaids were foolish because they didn't bring enough oil with them. I don't think it's because they weren't prepared for the bridegroom. I don't think it was because they went to sleep because the parable says all of them went to sleep even the ones who had plenty of oil. And it's getting close to midnight when they get around. So I don't think it has anything to do with being prepared with enough oil. I think that the foolish bridesmaids were foolish because they looked to other people and saw what they had compared it to what they themselves lacked and then got into a panic and forgot all about looking at the bridegroom. The bridegroom was coming. They were aroused and awakened in their sleep. So whoever aroused them from their sleep close to midnight had to be able to see the bridegroom coming in this story. So the bridegroom must have had a light. And so he, whoever it was that shouted the bridegroom was coming and aroused all of the bridesmaids would have been able to see that light as well. But these foolish bridesmaids, as they're described in here, instead of looking at the light from the bridegroom, looked at what they lacked and they began to panic. And so they go to those that they consider to have more and ask, for oil, for their lamps. They didn't think they were enough. They didn't think they had enough. And sometimes don't we do the same? Aren't there times when we think we're not good enough, we're not thin enough, we're not good looking enough, we don't make enough, we don't have enough, we don't whatever enough to do the things that we have been called to do. And once it hit me that perhaps this parable is not about being ready for the coming of the bridegroom at all. It's more about looking to the light that the bridegroom brings 
Because even if I were there in this story and I was one of the people in this story and I didn't have any oil in my lamp, I'm willing to bet that I could have followed the light from the bridegroom and gotten to the bridegroom had I not been so preoccupied with the things that I lack. Because there are times in our lives, and I think all of you, if you're honest with yourselves, can say you've been there, where you feel like you have nothing to offer. Maybe you feel like you don't have anything to offer in a community of faith, or maybe you have felt that way in the past. I know I certainly have. Maybe you feel like you have nothing to offer because you don't have enough money to give a certain percentage of your um, income like so many um, communities of faith practice. And you think, well, I have nothing. I have nothing to give. And so we focus so much on what we're lacking that we forget to look at the light that the bridegroom is bringing. And it distracts us. And because of that distraction, thinking that we don't have enough or that we're not enough, we miss out on the whole party. They missed out because they listened to the ones that did have oil who said, go, go find your own oil. And so they go out to the Dollar General and find, try to find oil. And while they're out trying to find their oil, they miss out on the party and the door is shut. And the bridegroom here is saying, I don't know you. Well, the bridegroom didn't know them because they didn't come to meet the bridegroom that night. Because they were so worried about what they did not have. When we ourselves get so focused on the things that we don't have, we miss out on the wonderful opportunities that God has in store for us. I read a lot this week from the theologian that I've mentioned in the past who helps me understand things a lot better and a lot easier sometimes. And you may have heard of her, Nadia Votes Weber. She is an ELCA, an evangelical, <coughs> evangelical Lutheran pastor. Um, and she's a speaker. She's actually going to be speaking at our General Synod this year. And she has a, just a profound and wonderful way of looking at scripture. So I want to end today with a quote from her about this particular parable. She says, maybe you are sitting here today having listened to a voice other than God's. And maybe the story it told you is so familiar that you think it's the truth. But consider that maybe you've been listening to the wrong voices all along. Listen, and maybe you can hear God saying, wait, who told you you didn't have enough oil? Wait, who told you you were naked, as Adam and Eve were told in the garden? Who told you that you have to lie to be loved? Who told you your body is not beautiful. Who told you that your only value is in your excellence? Who told you that what you have done, good or bad, is actually who you are? Who told you that? And in this article where she's saying this, she goes back to the Garden of Eden and she talks about the snake and the snake going to Eve and Adam and the whole fall of man that's in the story. And she says, who told you that? My money is on the snake. And I love this, because she doesn't mince any words. She said, and he's a damned liar. Always has been. So when snakes and bridesmaids start talking their foolish blasphemy, don't listen. You don't have to show up with everything you need. The light of Christ is bright enough. Always has been. Always will be. Amen. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you're able in your blessed assurance that you are enough as we sing our sermon hymn, Blessed Assurance.